Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Herbert Marshall in James Hilton's Lost Horizon on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we have the great honor of welcoming one of Hollywood's most distinguished actors, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thank you, Jimmy. It's a great honor for me to play in your Lost Horizon. Not only a wonderful story, but it has really put a new word into the language. Shangri-La. I wonder if before we start, you'd mind telling us whether there is a real Shangri-La somewhere. Well, you won't find it on any of the maps. But in a sort of a way, everyone can find his own Shangri-La in his own heart. It may not be easy, but the birth of a new year is a good time to make the resolution, to find a little personal peace of mind in a troubled world. And now, Frank Goss, haven't you a word or two to say? There's a new year coming, a new year with a brand new set of important days for remembering people, birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. For all these days, for every memorable occasion on your calendar, there's a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And on the back of every card appears the Hallmark that says, you cared enough to send the very best. Now, James Hilton's Lost Horizon, starring Herbert Marshall. You are now deep in the mountains of Tibet, the highest part of the Earth's surface. That snow-capped peak above you is Karakau, and below, in the valley of the blue moon, lies the Lamasery of Shangri-La. I came to this world across the mountains from India. We had been flying from Baskul to Peshawar on the northwest frontier. I was the British consul in Baskul, and my vice consul, a young fellow named Melanson, was making the trip with me. Besides us, there were two other passengers and the pilot. Our plane should have landed in Peshawar at about 5.30. We never arrived at our destination. Conway. I say, Conway, are you, are you asleep? What's the matter, Melanson? Anything wrong? I'm not sure. But I think our pilot's off his course. Nonsense. Well, look down there. Nothing but mountains, as far as you can see. I don't recognize this part of the world at all. I should say you were right, Manninson. The man's lost his way. What's that, Conway? Did you say we were lost? Lost? Good heavens. It's quite all right, Miss Sprinkler. There's nothing to be upset about, I'm sure. Still, there's nothing like finding out, is there? Shall I speak to the pilot, Conway? Thanks, I'll do it. You, there, pilot. Open the panel. I advise that you ask no questions, please. Oh, certainly. Look here. We want to know where we are. I advise that you be seated. I will not be seated. Manninson, I... I don't know whether you've noticed it, but there's a revolver pointed directly at my chest. I think you better do as the gentleman suggests. For hours after that, we sat in the darkness, each of us pretending to sleep. Suddenly, the plane lurched sharply. There was a loud rushing sound in my ears, and I realized that we were coming down, but fast, much too fast. We stumbled from the plane, badly shaken, and all but the pilot uninjured. The cold was intense, a solid icy cold that you could touch with your fingertips. I knew we must be somewhere in Tibet, a vast barren region of windswept upland. Conway, come here! There's something the matter with this pilot fellow! There was little we could do for him. And as the early rays of the sun caught the summit of the mountain, the man died. I say, Conway. Yeah? I've just been looking at that mountain. 
Am I seeing things? Or are those men coming toward us? They were men. A party of a dozen or more, crawling like ants across the white face of the cliff. As they drew near, we saw they carried among them a hooded chair. And in it, a heavily robed figure. An elderly Chinese, gray-haired, clean-shaven. I come from the Lamasery of Shangri-La. My name is Chang. You, sir, would you be good enough to present me to your friends? Of course, this is Miss Brinklow, How do you do? Mr. Barnard, and Mr. Melanson. My name is Conway. Conway, yes. Your plane is beyond repair? I'm afraid so. And anyway, our pilot is dead. Yes. You will come to Shangri-La. It is a hazardous journey, and the only place of habitation within a thousand miles. I shall be happy to accompany you. That's very kind, thank you. And we'd like to hire some of your porters to help us on the journey back. We want to return to civilization as soon as possible. Are you so certain you are away from it? There was a pass at 20,000 feet, which we managed with the aid of long ropes. When we had struggled breathlessly to the top, I saw above us, shimmering in the rosy twilight, the loveliest mountain on Earth. That snow-capped peak above you is Caracal. And below, in the valley of the blue moon, lies the Lamasery of Shangri-La. <laughs> I never exactly remembered how we arrived at the Lamasery. The thin air had a dreamlike texture, and I was conscious of a strange sensation, half mystical, half visual, of having reached at last some place that was an end, a finality. Shangri-La, I learned, was a sort of monastery whose inhabitants ruled the natives in the valley below. Those in full Lamahood numbered about 50, and their prevalent belief was in moderation, the virtue of avoiding excess of all kinds. These things I learned the first night as I stood with Chang on the broad balcony overlooking the valley. There is something more you would like to know, Mr. Conway? Please. I want to know, this morning, when you found us, were you setting out on a journey? No. Then you came there deliberately to intercept us? How did you know we were coming? <laughs> you are very clever. But I should counsel you not to worry your friends with these abstract discussions. No, they want something more concrete. They want to know exactly how long you're going to keep us here. Uh, there will be certain unavoidable delays. How long? The difficulties of the trip. Securing the necessary porters. How long, please? You may tell your friends a few months. But you don't guarantee it. Is that what you mean? For myself, I can't say I shall mind a great deal. It's a new and interesting experience. In time to come, you may find it even more interesting. Good night. In the days that followed at Shangri-La, I gave myself over to a rich and growing enchantment. In the petal-colored buildings which dotted the mountain, I recognized priceless treasures of art, paintings and sketches, exquisite ceramics preserved for more than a thousand years. In the spacious library, I discovered the great literature of the present and of centuries past. One morning, I stood beside a lotus pool in an open pavilion of the Lamasery. In an archway behind me, a young girl was seated at a harpsichord. That was very lovely. You are pleased? More than pleased. Oh, my name is Hugh Conway. They call me Lotsen. Lotsen. And do you live below in the valley? No, I live here. At the Lamasery? Yes. But as yet, I have not attained the full Lamahut. You mean you are a Lama? Yes. 
I'm a bit confused. I thought only men could be llamas. They will tell you when you have been here longer that in the llama hood there are no distinctions between a man and a woman. But you... you're hardly more than a child. Shall I play for you again? Please. Good morning. Oh, Chang. You are pleased with Lotsen? She plays beautifully. She has studied for a great many years. Oh, how could she? How old is Lotsen? I'm afraid I, I cannot tell you. One night the moonlight fell on Shangri-La, bathing the pavilion in a sea of blue. I am sorry to disturb you at this hour, but I bring you important news. Yes, Chang. I congratulate you, sir. Tonight you are to be received by the High Lama. As I followed Chang through the Lamasery, I knew I was on the threshold of some great discovery. Pattering in front of me, he mounted a spiral staircase to a door which opened noiselessly before us. Chang left silently. As I became accustomed to the gloom, I saw sitting before me a small and wrinkled man. He was motionless, a fading antique portrait in Chinese dress. His face thin and drawn tight over the frame of his skull and his eyes. I felt dizzy beneath the gaze of those ancient eyes. You are Mr. Conway. I am. It is a pleasure to see you, Mr. Conway. Please sit down. I am an old man and can do no one any harm. I feel it a great honor to be received by you. Thank you. Chang tells me you have been asking many questions about our community and its affairs. I am very much interested in them. The history of Shangri-La begins rightly in the city of Peking in the year 1719. For it was then that four friars set out on a long and perilous journey. They traveled southwest for many months by Lan Chao and No No Kaua, facing many hardships. Three died on the way, and the fourth was not far from death, when by accident he stumbled into the rocky defile that today remains the only practical approach to our valley of the blue moon. There, to his joy and surprise, he found a friendly population who bade him welcome, and quickly he recovered his health. His name was Father Perrault. For more than half a century, Father Perrault labored with his hands like any other man, tilling his own garden and learning from the inhabitants as well as teaching them. Then, in the year 1789, news descended to the valley that Father Perrault was dying at last. He bade his friends farewell, but the end was not yet. He lay for many weeks without speech or movement, and then he began to recover. He was then 108. The ancient Lama paused. What he had told me was not beyond belief, but as he went on, I was held speechless with wonder. It was 14 years later, he told me, that a wanderer found his way to Father Perrault's monastery, an Austrian named Henschel. A great friendship sprang up between the two, and Henschel stayed on. It was then that they had a wild, fantastic dream. Art treasures from Europe and Asia were purchased for the valley's gold and stored at Shangri-La. The library was filled with the great works of the world. And later it was decided to admit travelers and strangers who had lost their way. Yes, Mr. Conway. Strangers might come as freely as they wished, but with one important proviso. And what was that? In 1910, Henschel died. He was killed. In 1910? But you, you said he came here in 1803. Yes. And he was killed, you said? Yes. A traveler shot him. There had been a quarrel about some porters. Henschel had just told him of the important proviso that governs our reception of guests. And perhaps you are wondering, my dear Conway, what that proviso may be. 
I think I can already guess. We are to stay here all of our lives. And can you guess anything else after this long and curious story of mine? It seems impossible. And yet impossible as it may be, I know that it's the truth. What is, my son? That you are still alive, Father Perot. In a moment, James Hilton will return to bring you the second act of Lost Horizon, starring Herbert Marshall. Your 1949 Hallmark date book is waiting for you now. It's your friendly Hallmark store's way of saying Happy New Year to you. People who already have theirs say it's just about the most useful little book they ever saw. There's a separate calendar page for every month of the coming year, and space for jotting down things to remember each day. There's also room for names and addresses of people you'll want to remember during each month. And in the back, well, there's one of the most useful features of all, a place for next year's Christmas card list with a way to check each name to show cards sent and cards received. Yes, a Hallmark date book is so convenient, you'll find yourself referring to it constantly, using it for all sorts of reminders to yourself. Reminders of social engagements, appointments, anniversaries. Reminders to do those thoughtful little things that will mean so much to all your friends and loved ones through the coming year. It's just the right size to slip into your purse or to keep handy beside your telephone. And it's such a beautiful little book with its camellia-decorated cover, its pink and white pages. Now, to get your Hallmark date book, simply visit the friendly store where you find Hallmark greeting cards and ask for it. It's yours without obligation. Better get your Hallmark date book right away in time to start the new year right. And now, James Hilton and the second act of Lost Horizon, starring Herbert Marshall. Conway learned one of the secrets of Shangri-La that night, the secret of prolonged human life. For the High Lama who sat beside him had lived for nearly two and a half centuries. Conway's coming was no accident, he said. There had been no travelers to Shangri-La for 20 years. Many Lamas had died, and the pilot had been sent out into the world to find new persons to take their places. Then there is death at Shangri-La. Yes, my son. There are many of us who live no more than a hundred years. And if one of your lamas were to leave the valley of the blue moon... He would die. His years would fall on his shoulders like a great burden, and he would die very soon. An old, old man. Lutzen. You have seen the High Lama? Lutzen, how did you come here? I was betrothed to a prince of Turkestan. We were traveling to Kashgar to meet him when my carriers lost their way in the mountains. When did this happen? I was 18. 18? Then now you are... The missionaries of Shangri-La found us. They brought us here. I never saw the man I was to marry. Then in all these years, you have never known the meaning of love. Lutzen, is there no love at Shangri-La? She did not answer, but I saw a faint flush rising in her ivory cheek. And then I was aware that someone had entered the pavilion and was watching us. It was Melanson. One night, at midnight, I was summoned to the presence of the High Lama. Tell me, my son, have you been happy at Shangri-La? Quite happy, Father Perot. And what of your friends? Will they learn to be content also? I'm afraid Madison is going to be a problem. He is going to be your problem. Why mine? Because, my son, I am going to die. You, Father Perot. Yes, we are all mortal even here in the Valley of the Blue Moon. 
But I must feel at rest before I die. That is why I sent for you tonight. You do me a great honor, Father. I have waited for you, my son, for a long time. My son, there is a great storm gathering in the world, a black fury which will not spend itself for many years. It may rage till every flower of culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. But I believe that you will live through the storm. I see a new world stirring in the ruins, seeking its lost and legendary treasures. And they will all be here, my son, hidden behind the mountains in the valley of the blue moon. And you will be here to give them to the hopeful world. My son, I place in your hands the heritage and destiny of Shangri-La. The High Lama stopped speaking. The glow in his eyes faded. Presently it came to me as in a dream. The High Lama was dead. <laughs> I've been waiting for you. I said, what's the matter, Conway? Are you ill? No, just tired. Well, pull yourself together, man. The porters are waiting for us. Porters? It's all arranged. They're going to take us back to Peshawar. Miss Brinklow and Barnard are staying. Who's been making all these plans? Lutzen. She's with the porters now. She's waiting. No. I'm in love with Lutzen. And she loves me. She's coming with us. Lutzen must not go. It's impossible. Why? Why is it impossible? You must take my word for it. Lutzen must never leave here. Conway, we need your help. We can't manage the cliff without you. I want to get away from this place. And Lotsen, too. She's young. Doesn't she count? Lotsen is not young. Not young, you're raving It's man. the truth. Her beauty is a fragile thing that can live only where fragile things are loved. Madison, listen to me. I tried then to tell him the secret of Shangri-La. He looked at me as though I were mad. And as I read the disbelief in his eyes, I began to doubt myself. And then, Lutzen came to me. You will help us, please. We need you. Lutzen, do you wish to leave Shangri-La? Yes. You understand the risk? If you leave this valley, you will fade away like an echo. Oh, you have been listening to the fables of these old men. You mean... I love him. If he is not with me, I would die. Here. <laughs> For hours I paced the balcony. I could not tell whether I had been mad and was now sane or had been sane for a time and was now mad again. But always before we were the, the wistful, pleading eyes of the little Manchu girl. That morning, with the wind roaring through the jagged cliffs, we made the descent from Shangri-La. <laughs> weeks they traveled toward the east, Mallinson, the girl, and Conway, and then the porters began to desert. One by one they disappeared, then there were just the three of them, creeping like snails across the desert wilderness. For a long while there were only two. Mallinson had died. At first Conway tried to believe it was the hardship of the journey which had changed Lord Sen. We must go on, Lutzen. I'm tired. That must be the last range left mountain. You see, Lutzen. It is too far. I cannot see so far. One more step, Lutzen. One more step. One more. One more. One more. No! You must go on alone from here. Her eyes were shadows her skin drawn, the color of ancient parchment, her cheekbones. Lord Sen, Lord Sen. I am old. I am so old. So
found us on the road to Chongqiang, and we were taken to the hospital there. Lot Sen, they told me later. Lot Sen died that same night. The oldest woman they had ever seen. The storm of which Father Perot warned me still threatens the world. Not yet has the Christian ethic been fulfilled when the meek shall inherit the earth. But Shangri-La has a heritage to cherish and bequeath with such wisdom as men will need when their passions are spent. Soon I hope I will return. Somewhere beyond Lhasa, on the high roof of the world, I seem to picture a long plateau running north and far away a mountain rising white against the sky. I hope to find it again, for this, I think, is Caracal. And beyond is Shangri-La and the Valley of the Blue Moon. Before James Hilton returns with Herbert Marshall to tell you about next week's show, our first show for the new year, here's a wish for the new year from the makers of Hallmark greeting cards. May your calendar for 1949 be filled with memorable days, and may they all be happy ones. To keep a record of them, remember to get your Hallmark date book. It's waiting for you now. It's yours without obligation from the friendly store where you find Hallmark greeting cards. Now, here is James Hilton. You've heard the legend of Shangri-La with its abiding message of peace. I hope most fondly that the new year will bring all of us some of that same peace, some of that same freedom of mind and spirit, and above all, some of that same inner happiness. To you, Herbert Marshall, our most sincere thanks for being Conway and for the warm and sympathetic character you created for us. Jimmy, there's nothing in modern literature I know of that leaves one with such hope and beauty and the feeling of future promise as does the poetry and philosophy you have woven into Lost Horizon. Thank you, Jimmy, for the pleasure I've had. And I'd like to thank your sponsors, the maker of of Hallmark Cards, for having shown the good taste to have chosen you as their weekly host. But from what I've seen of their fine greeting cards, good taste is a tradition with Hallmark. Thank you, Bart, for those nice words, for your own superb performance, and for just being with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, the old year is fast drawing to a close and the new year is just about ready to lift its head over the horizon of history. All of us, Dee Engelbach, our director-producer, Lynn Murray, who composed and conducted the music, George Wells, our adapter for tonight, and every one of us who is a member of the Hallmark family hopes that for you the new year will bring rich blessings and the fulfillment of your dearest wishes. Next week we'll present one of the motion picture's most popular actors, Robert Young, in a great story by Louis Brumfield, MacLeod's Folly. And the following week, Helen Hull's Clay Shuttered Doors, starring Jane Wyman. So until next year, and that is to say next Thursday, this is James Hilton saying good night and a happy new year. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you carry enough to send the very best. Herbert Marshall will soon be seen with Margaret O'Brien and Metro Golden Mayor's The Secret Garden. This is Frank Goss saying good night. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.